Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Today I got a special guest for you. John here is going to tell us about what he knows about heart blocks and how to differentiate. Tell us about it, John. Okay, maybe John's not going to tell us today, but I am going to help you learn how to decipher and know the difference in each of the heart blocks, and we're going to make it super simple. So let's get at it. This just in, if you haven't hit that button to subscribe to the channel, it's time. Do it. Get right into it. Let's talk about normal conduction. And we're going to show you the pathway of how the electrical current flows through the heart. We're going to show that in relation to an ECG waveform. And then that will help you in the long term. It's going to help you diagnose heart blocks and understand why they happen a little bit better. So here you've got, in the picture, you've got the SA node here. This is considered the pacemaker of the heart. It's what sets the tone for your heartbeat. So, and then on the bottom, you've got what's called an AV node. So when the SA node fires off a signal, it goes to the AV node. It also comes around here and around here. And that basically depolarizes both of your atrium at one time. So that's what gives you your squeeze on the top. That's kind of hard here to see it, but underneath here, you come down to what's called the bundle of his. And this is what's going to set the tone for your ventricles. So now from the bundle of his, you've got kind of two separate pathways. And I know people have heard the term left and right bundle branch. Well, that's where it comes in because the bundle of his separates into two branches, a left and a right. So once the, the electrical signal goes from the AV node to the bundle of his. There's a slight delay there, which gives your time from your atrium and your ventricles contracting separate from each other. Once it starts to travel down those bundle branch, this is called an electrical depolarization. It means it's getting rid of its current. And what happens when we shock the muscle with current? Well, it squeezes together and now you have contraction. So as that travels down both of those bundle branches, now it fizzles out into what's called the Purkinje fibers, which is a network of lots of small, small fibers. Now, you'll see these as what's on the ECG. This is now the T wave. So this is when it repolarizes. It's kind of resetting and getting ready to do it all over again. So how does this all relate? So SA node fires to the AV node here. This is your P wave. This little beat right here, that is your atrium contraction. Now, when you go from the AV node and you're going through this kind of slowed process to the bundle of his, once it reaches there and it fires down the bundle of his, that's where we now have your QRS. This is your ventricle squeeze. Look at the difference. You got a little P, a much bigger QRS, but look at the size and the workforce of both the atrium has squeeze but not as much squeeze as those big ventricles and then you got your T wave which is what we said earlier this is your Purkinje fibers down at the bottom they're repolarizing they're resetting everything to get ready for the next round so now that we know what the pathway of the heart is what we're going to look at is what causes abnormalities what causes heart blocks now it's also important to know because we're going to be talking about times and segments. I put an ECG block here so it shows you it's broken into bigger blocks and little blocks. So we've got separation here. These bigger blocks, the whole segment itself is 0.2 seconds. And then if you want to look at them by the smaller blocks, the smaller blocks are 0 0.04. Now these are little tiny guys here. So in, when you go to measure and you're going to know when you measure what's off, what's wrong, and this is going to help you kind of troubleshoot too, at least knowing the sizes and measurements of time is going to help you in order to do this. So let's get ready. Let's go over and look at the heart blocks and how we can diagnose them from normal conduction. 
All right, first up, we got first degree heart blocks. So what this looks like on paper is you've got an ECG that now has a prolonged PR interval. So remember, we said anything greater than 0.20 is going to be considered long. So why is that? So you got your ECG comes across now, and it looks like this. Notice the difference here in your interval for your PR versus now. You have here to here much greater distance and it's going to be greater than 0.20 seconds so that's what's characterized and why is that so you've got your SA node you've got your AV node fires across fires down and around just like normal but remember where we've got this bundle of his that then breaks down stream here to bundle branches and Purkinje's Remember, we've got to cross this path right here. Remember, there's this imaginary gateway that it's got to cross through here before it comes to the other side. So what happens is, in that area there, so you got your gateway. Now you have this slowed conduction. So it's coming across, gets slowed down here for a second, and then allowed to pass. And then it eventually travels down and around, just like normal. But that's where you're getting your prolonged PR. So you're getting your atrial kick to start here and going out, characterized by this. And then once it comes to this here, to this imaginary gateway, that's why it's taking so long to come right here. And then that's why you have that first degree block. So basically, all first degree is prolonged PR interval greater than 0.2 seconds. Okay, next up. We've got second degree Mobitz 1, also called Winkybach. Uh, I know that gets a little confusing between Mobitz 1 and Winkybach, uh, but really is a mixed bag of what you're going to hear. Just knowing that it can be, it's the same thing either or. Um, so what is a second degree Mobitz 1? So great example at the bottom. So we've got a P wave. At a normal distance look at your next one here this one here look at the distance it covers a little bit longer next complex a lot longer and then notice the other one now you have a P wave but there's no complex it has stretched the interval out so far now that there is no QRS behind it and you notice immediately after it goes back to a normal PR interval and it's going to repeat this process. And a lot of people know the Winky Bach term by longer, longer drop Winky Bach. And it just kind of sticks and uh, it's a good mnemonic. So, but does that really play out for the term Mobitz 1? Not really. You just got to know that these are interchangeable and this is what it is. So, basically your SA node fires over to your AV node just like we did before all is good in the hood and then you got your gateway here before we come over here to the bundle of his we've got normal conduction we've got kind of slowed conduction slower conduction and then once we go here it just doesn't even pass anymore and then we've got this mit this mist complex down here at the bottom so that's what essentially a second degree Mobitz one is. Is this detrimental? No, to most people it's unknown um, and not treated in some if they're asymptomatic, um, but sometimes medications, inferior MIs, uh, myocarditis can be a cause of this. Um, but notice in this one, difference in first degree versus second degree here before in first degree we had a one-to-one -one. so we had a, a P wave for every QRS and in this we've got one less QRS than P waves so that's kind of a giveaway and then the consistent longer PR intervals is a dead giveaway for Mobitz type 1. Mobitz 2 yes believe it or not only has one name this time which is fantastic so, what's the difference in a Mobitz 1 and Mobitz 2, and how can I tell them apart? So, remember, Mobitz 1, we said, had a longer, longer, longer PR interval before you eventually dropped one. So, look at this down here. 
you've got a Mobitz 2, you've got a regular PR interval, followed by another complex with a regular PR interval, another regular, and then all of a sudden we have now this lone little P wave with nothing behind it, no QRS whatsoever. So there's your big difference in a Mobitz 1 and 2. Mobitz 2, you've got regular PR intervals to go with your QRS, but you're going to be dropping a complex every so often. So look at below it, it's showing you what a 2 to 1 is. It's just another name for the frequency of how often. So regular PR followed by a QRS, and now you've got this, Lone Soldier no complex back to normal PR with a complex lone soldier no complex now you see why it's a two to one block you can have this in the form of a three to one a four to one and it's just gonna do the same pattern it just has a regular pattern and that's why they call it that so Mobitz 2 regular PR interval sometimes you have a P with no carrots behind it and then when we're talking about it in the diagram of the heart, you're going to have your SA. It's going to fire over here, just like we did before, right? It's going to want to cross this imaginary threshold we've got. Some go straight through. One, maybe. Two, maybe. Three hits this rock wall. It never makes it to the other side. And that's what leaves you with a P wave, but no QRS to follow. So, Severity of a second degree Mobitz 2, can it be more severe than a type 1? Yeah, it sure could. Um, this can also often develop into a third degree heart block, um, which is well more dangerous. So is this something to worry about? Yes. And then we need to look at causes. What may have caused this and what can we do to correct it? Caboose, we've got third degree heart block, also known as complete heart block. Um, and sometimes called AV dissociation. Um, I like complete heart block because it makes more sense as to what we're talking about and what the block actually is. So we've been talking about this SA node and firing to the AV node, and then we're having to make this trek across this kind of made up barrier here. But in a complete heart block, every signal that comes from this AV node now nothing comes through 100 percent blocked giving it the term complete heart block so you've got now these atrium they're doing their thing and it shows here because look on this ecg tracing so remember atrium is your p wave so you've got a p wave you got a p wave p look how just beautifully you can't see this one but it's buried in there look how much how regular this is it's just automatic it's firing just like it would in a normal circumstance but nothing's making it through your barrier here so now you ask the question is how do you have these wide complexes here like well if you can't pass electricity through how are they conducting so all this is caused by these Purkinje fibers down the bottom so these are pretty special these have what would be called the backup pacemaker for the heart um, and these are called ventricular escape rhythms is what these are and so they look a little bit different than your normal QRS's they're wide so these cells that make up the Purkinje fibers there are a special kind of cell and they have what's called automaticity and that means they make up their own beat they do it automatically now look how much different Look how many P waves you have marked here on the bottom versus we have three to four escape rhythms. So widely different in the amount. That's because the as the backup pacemaker of the heart, it's not able to do the amount of work that the SA node is. It cannot keep up with it. This is just strictly in survival mode. So your SA nodes fire in anywhere from 60 to 100 beats per minute. And then you've got your Purkinje fibers firing out anywhere from 30 to 40 beats per minute. And that's why it looks so different, right? But notice 
now that everything has been kind of dissociated from each other, we got this imaginary line here now, and these atria are doing their own thing, these ventricles are doing their own thing, and they're doing them completely separate. So if you go back and you look at the ECG tracing, get rid of some of these lines, you can tell that every atrial beat here, this PR interval is long but normal-ish. This one, super duper long. And then the next one is super short. And they're just all over the place. Nothing matches up and they're completely separate in what they're doing. Third degree is extremely dangerous. The body is not really capable for most people of keeping up hemodynamically with this kind of dissociation going on because you're putting out, you know, a quarter of what your body is used to as far as blood flow. And depending on the person, a quarter sometimes is not good enough. I mean, these people are at high risk for cardiac arrest. Um, these people need temporary pacemakers, emergent temporary pacemakers, and more than likely they're going to be getting a permanent one from there on out. So you can see third degree is completely different in any other heart block that we've talked about thus far, but rightfully so, it is the most dangerous and it comes with the most complications. Um, hopefully this helps clear up third degree complete heart block and how it's different. So let's talk about what the causes of heart block could be. So inferior MRIs are a big one. And that's because if you look at the way the heart's laid out and where your SA, your AV nodes are, your RCA feeds that entire area. So think if you've had an MI there and you've had any kind of infarction in that area, well, you're essentially starving that area that has the conduction system attached to it. So that's a perfect breeding ground for having conduction problems. Um, AV nodal blockers such as calcium channel blockers, beta blockers, DIG, um, those are you know seen more than not as well and sometimes all you need is a washout and the, after the medicine washes out of their body heart block resolves and all is good. Um, Lyme disease is also something that can cause heart blocks and then there's idiopathic degeneration of the conduction system itself. Um, in most of those cases you're going to need a pacemaker irregardless with the generation of the conduction system because it just doesn't get better over time. Alright guys, thanks for stopping by today and learning about heart blocks. Hopefully this made things a little bit easier for you and now you can differentiate between heart blocks um a little bit faster and if there's anything that you think we need to add or change let me know in the comments below um, like always subscribe to the channel if you haven't and we look forward to seeing you on the next time